Ugh, spare me. Hey guys, welcome back. Today I will be giving you a brief overview of the boringness that was Spare by Prince Harry. But the highlight of this video will be the incredibly awkward passages from the book that I'm going to read, so stay tuned for that. Now, to be fair, I was looking forward to this book. I thought it would be an entertaining read, but boy was I wrong. Who knew that a prince's life could be so boring? So the book was split into three sections. The first was surrounding Diana's death and the aftermath. And then the second was his army years. And then the third section was Megan. Each section had about 50 to 80 passages that I would consider reading like diary entries instead of actual chapters. And each of these passages ranged from half of a page to about four pages. So this first section focused on the day of Diana's death and Harry from ages 12 to 22. Throughout this section, every few pages, it seemed like he would mention his sorrow regarding his mother. It was clear that he was unable to properly grieve her as a child. The first section makes that very clear and very apparent, but also the majority of this first section of the book was mainly what felt like the rambling thoughts of a preteen boy. It's like when you're reading through like your old childhood diaries as an adult and you're like, why did I write about this random thing? Well, those types of things made it into the book. I know it's pretty well known that a popular ghost writer, J.R. Moringer, was used for this book, but Damn, did they not have an editor? I could have cut this book down by half. It was way too long. 400 pages? Like, I don't need to know your every thought, my dude. But clearly, Harry disagrees with that. I just want to go through some of the awkward passages that seem to, like, always come out of nowhere. More like quotes, I suppose, that were just kind of like, you. I read it and I was like, why do we leave this in here? Okay. Okay, we have section one, which is titled Out of the Night That Covers Me. So first we have a bit of what, in my opinion, was a bit of like tone deafness. So this passage is from when he's like 12. Footmen arrived carrying trays covered with plates, each topped with a silver dome. The footmen set the trays upon wooden stands, then joked with us, as they always did, before wishing us a bon appetit. Footmen, bone china, it sounds posh, obviously. And I suppose it was, but under those fancy domes was just kitty stuff. Fish fingers, cottage pies, roast chicken, green beans. <laughs> yeah, roast chicken is kitty stuff. Like, do you know, like, I grew up pretty poor. You know what kitty stuff was for me? It was pizza rolls. Like, not roast chicken. <laughs> Talking about his time at school. Where more than 100 boys lived in proximity, we ate together, bathed together, slept together, sometimes tend to a room. Everyone knew everyone's business, down to who was circumcised and who wasn't. We called it roundheads versus cavaliers. <laughs> Talking about the teachers. They fancied themselves our surrogates, mums away from mums. They always chirped, which had been odd, but now especially confusing because of mummy's disappearance, and also because the matrons were suddenly dot dot dot. Hot. I had a crush on Miss Roberts. I felt certain I'd marry her one day. I also recall two Miss Lynns, Miss Lynn Major and Miss Lynn Minor. <laughs> they were sisters. I was deeply smitten with the latter. I reckoned I'd marry her too. Talking about school assignments. One piece of literature I remember enjoying, even savoring, was a slender American novel of Mice and Men. We were assigned it in our England English divs. Unlike Shakespeare, Steinbeck didn't need a translator. He wrote in plain, simple vernacular. Better yet, he kept it tight. <laughs> of Mice and Men, a brisk 150 pages. He really should have taken that to heart. 400 pages? This should have been a brisk 150. 
and now one of my personal favorites. I suspected he was referring to my recent loss of virginity. Inglorious episode with an older woman. She liked horses quite a lot and treated me not unlike a young stallion. Quick ride. <laughs> Quick ride after she smacked my rump and sent me off to graze. <laughs> Why? Okay, like that story about him losing his virginity sounds a lot more interesting than like this other dreck that he's been droning on about for however many pages. Okay, so those are just some like little snippets of like, you know, what's in the book. He talked about being away at school and then meeting Camilla, his future stepmom, and then entering into a new school, one that uh, Willie was at. Oh, by the way, throughout the book, he calls Prince William Willie throughout the whole book. It was, for me, it was incredibly distracting and hilarious. So they're at boarding school together and Willie told him to pretend like they didn't know each other. This part killed me. Don't worry, you'll be all right. And don't forget, you always have your brother here, but I wasn't the one forgetting. Willie told me to pretend I don't know him. What? You don't know me, Harold, and I don't know you. For the last two years, he explained, Eaton had been his sanctuary. No kid brother tagging along, pestering him with questions, pushing up on his social circle. He was forging his own life and he wasn't willing to give that up. Like, Willie, do you, do you not understand that like everyone in school is going to know that like these two princes are brothers. Like everyone knows that you're related, right? Throughout the whole book, it's pretty clear that Harry and Willie didn't get along, um, mainly on Willie's side from Harry's point of view. And we have this nice section that had some very nice foreshadowing for what was to come. So literally they're, they're in the car with Pa. He calls his dad Pa also weird and distracting, but they're, him and Willie are fighting and Pa swerved to the side of the road, shouted at Willie to get out. Me, why me? Pa didn't feel the need to explain. Out. Willie turned to me furious. He felt like I got away with everything. He stepped out of the car, stomped to the backup car with all the bodyguards, strapped himself in. We always wore seatbelts after mummy's disappearance. The convoy resumed. Now and then I peered out the back window. Behind us, I could make out the future King of England plotting his revenge. Dun, dun, dun. So also in this section is when the media started labeling Harry as the naughty one. And clearly the media had a huge negative impact on Harry's mental health, which obviously how could it not? So like one example was the tabloids released this story saying that he was a drug addict, which he says the story wasn't true. And then a few pages later, he says they tried to do another story saying that they had a picture of him doing coke and he called their bluff and was like, they don't have a picture of me doing coke. Um, so they didn't end up doing the story. But then he says at this point that he actually had been doing coke. So, you know, the irony. So for me, the most alarming thing during this whole first section was how many times as a child he kept almost pretending that his mother was still alive and was just hiding. He would relate almost everything in the book back to her, like things that reminded him of her, things like that. But then there was also like this section where he was talking about her funeral and with the casket. And he said that like, oh, but the casket was empty and all was well. And it's like, it, I really do feel for him that like he didn't get the proper emotional support during this time um, to where he was just convinced that she was still alive and was just hiding. Um, that kind of hurt me. So then this section ends with his boot camp for the army and the graduation ceremony where he mentions that he went into the army before Willie because Willie went to college first and then the army. And he said for one brief moment, spare outranked air. Good for you, bud. Section two called bloody but unbowed. This whole second section was Harry from ages 23 to 32. And basically it was 145 pages of military talk. Maybe to someone else, this section about military training and learning skills for flying, et cetera, could be entertaining. But for me, it was dry and it was a big old snooze fest. So here's the quick lowdown. The Crown decided that Harry being deployed to Iraq was too dangerous for a prince because he was too much of a target. 
So then he threatened to quit the army if they didn't put him somewhere. So instead his commanding officer was like, I have a different job you can do. You know, it's a job that everyone wants, but you know, let's just give it to the whiny prince who's threatening to quit. So Harry trained to be a forward air controller and then he was deployed to Afghanistan. Then he was pulled out of Afghanistan due to people catching wind that he was there. So again, it was unsafe. And then again, he complained to his commanding officer about not having anything to do. So the officer was like, fine, okay, let's have you fly helicopters. How long until I can qualify as a pilot, General? About two years. I shook my head. Too long, sir. He shrugged. It takes what it takes, and for good reason. There was a great deal of schoolwork involved, he explained. Bloody hell. At every turn, my life was determined to drag me back into a classroom. I thanked him told him I would think about it. Like, I like how Harry's getting all snippy about how long it will take to become a pilot. It's like, okay, dude, you understand how dangerous it is to fly a helicopter, right? Like for me, two years does not seem like long enough to learn that particular skill, but you know, he, he'll have to think about it. So he decided, yeah, I'll be a pilot. So he does training and then he, the army pronounced me ready to fly, but nope, it was a trick. I wasn't going to fly. I was going to sit in a windowless classroom and read about flying. I thought, could it be any crueler? Promise me a helicopter, hand me a stack of homework. The course lasted three months during which I nearly went insane. Every night I'd slump back to my cell-like room in the officer's mess and vent to a mate on the phone or else my bodyguard. I considered leaving the course altogether. I like how his initial thought constantly Constantly is like, I don't like this, I'm gonna quit. So he's he's now flying, because he whatever did his did his homework. This part just like irritated me. The most technologically complex helicopter in the world, and also the most nimble. I could see why only a handful of people on Earth knew how to fly, and why it cost millions of dollars to train each of those people. Like, yeah, aren't you lucky? Now, to be fair, I do respect that he wanted to do something to make a difference. Like he was constantly begging to go to war and he was constantly wanting to feel like he had a purpose. But I think that the way these sections were written about his service were so poorly done. They made him sound whiny and entitled and just not humble or inspiring at all. It's a shame, really. I think that with how important serving was to him, the book could have conveyed that better. In this section as well is when Willie gets married and again, we have more sections talking about how the brothers are not close. Soon after we returned to Britain, the palace announced that Willie was going to marry, November 2010. News to me. All that time together in Leslo, he never mentioned it. The papers published florid stories about the moment I realized Willie and Kate were well matched, the moment I appreciated the depth of their love, and thus decided to gift Willie the ring I inherited from Mummy, the legendary sapphire, a tender moment between brothers, a bonding moment for all three of us, and absolute rubbish. None of it ever happened. Also, this whole um, wedding section <laughs> was overshadowed by Harry's infamous penis debacle. If you have heard anything about this book, I'm sure you have heard mentioned Harry's frostbite incident, which is so cringy. Like why this is in the book, I have no idea. So here's the story. About a month prior to the wedding, Harry went with a group of wounded soldiers who were raising money for the walking with the wounded. On this journey, they were going to become the first amputees to reach the pole unsupported. Like, okay, great. It sounds like a great cause and an interesting story. But literally the only thing we got out of this section? Meanwhile, I regaled the company with tales of the North Pole. Pa was very interested and sympathetic about the discomfort of my frost-nipped ears and cheeks. And it was an effort not to overshare and tell him about my equally tender penis. Upon arriving home, I'd been horrified to discover that my nether regions were frost-nipped as well. And while the ears and cheeks were already healing, the Taja wasn't. Like, why? <laughs> like, wh <laughs> why do you want to tell us about this? Like, why not tell us about like 
you know, tell us more about like this, this great adventure that you were going on, you know, for a great cause. But instead you're literally over here like, I need to tell everybody about my todger. And then he just kept on about it. Between these thoughts of mummy and death and my frost nipped penis, I was in danger of becoming as anxious as the groom. What was the universe out to prove by taking my penis at the same moment it took my brother? <laughs> They'd set a world record, raised a truckload of cash for wounded veterans, and reached the bloody North Pole. I congratulated them, told them I missed them, and wished I could have been there. A white lie. My penis was oscillating between extremely sensitive and borderline traumatized. I'd been trying some home res remedies, including one recommended by a friend. She urged me to apply Elizabeth Arden cream. My mom used that on her lips. You wanted me to put that on my todger? <laughs> it works, Harry, trust me. I found a tube, and the minute I opened it, the smell transported me through time. I felt as if my mother was right there in the room when I took a smidge and applied it down there. Weird doesn't really do the feeling justice. I need to see a doctor ASAP. So he sees a doctor. Remind me of the problem. I showed him my todger, softened by Elizabeth Arden. He couldn't see anything. Nothing to see, I explained. It was an invisible scourge. For whatever reason, my particular case of frostnip manifested as a greatly heightened sensation. How did this happen, he wanted to know. North Pole, I told him. I went to the North Pole and now my South Pole is on the fritz. His face said, curiouser and curiouser. I described the cascading dysfunctions. Everything's difficult, doctor. Sitting, walking, sex, I added, was out of the question. Worse, my todger constantly felt like it was having sex or ready to. I was sort of losing it, I told him. I'd made the mistake of Googling this injury and I'd read horror stories about partial panectomies. <laughs> He said he was going to rule out other things. He gave me a full examination, which was more than invasive. No stone unturned, so to speak. The likeliest cure, he announced at last, would be time. What do you mean, time? Time, he said, heals. Really, Doc? That hadn't been my experience. So I think he literally went on and told this whole story about his Taja because he wanted to write about this moment and seem deep when the doctor told him that the cure would be time because time heals. And he's like, that hasn't been my experience. Poor, poor royal me. That whole thing was just, we, we could have not. Like we could have just, again, cut, cut, cut. Where were the editors? So intermixed throughout this whole army section, he also glossed over different trips he took to Africa, America, the Caribbean, Berlin, Paris, et cetera, et cetera. He also talked about different love interests that he had who eventually stopped being with him because the press was too much. And he addressed some scandals he was involved in, which seemed like they always resulted in the same thing of him basically just being like, I don't know, I was stupid back then, sorry. Also throughout this whole section, but more like aggressively near the end, Harry was obsessed with wanting to get married. And then, you know, that mixed with his PTSD from the war, plus extreme anxiety, and what seemed like also depression. The last 40 or so pages of this section just made me super sad. Which leads us to the last section, section three, titled Captain of My Soul. This whole section is just him and Megan's love story. I thought it was nice that he finally found someone and he kept gushing about how great she was. He saw her on Instagram and was like, ooh, pretty girl. And it just kind of took off from there. You know, good for him. Love a good love story. So intermixed with him talking about their relationship, this section was also overfilled with more of his complaints about the media and the lies that were created about him and Megan. And like, I'm not sure exactly how to feel about this section. Like, yeah, obviously it sucks that you're being chased around and stories are being fabricated about you. But at the same time, like I kind of agreed with Willie when he said, don't worry, Harold, nobody believes that shit. Personally, I don't care about celebrity or like royal news. Like I'm too obsessed with fictional book characters to care about famous people. And it just feels like Harry is convinced that everyone cares about what is being written about him. And it made him seem very conceited. Like, who cares what people think of you? But throughout his whole life, he has always read what they've written about him. And, you know, that's just a terrible idea. 
And then him and Meg are on their royal engagement tour. And he says, crowds went wild for her. Meg, Diana would have loved you. I heard women scream this time and time again. A total departure from the tone and tenor of the tabloids. And also a reminder, the British press wasn't reality. Like, obviously. But again, this is what his entire family has been telling him throughout the entirety of the book. Like, just ignore the media. <laughs> then the remainder of this section just focuses on the drama with the wedding details, and it just felt like filler. Again, more stuff that could have been cut. If you've watched my videos before, then you know that I hate reading about anything related to weddings. I just find obsessive wedding planning and details to be so annoying and pointless. But if you didn't know that and would like to subscribe to my channel and check out more of my older videos, then be my guest. I would appreciate it. So finally, the wedding happens. And it's so awkward because after the wedding bits, Harry then just starts talking about how much he and Meghan don't get along with Willie and Kate. And it's awkward because like, obviously this is Harry's side of the story. And you know, with every story, there's your side, my side, and the truth. And these passages just felt like petty gossip. Like, it's not cute, and I thought it would be fun to read about the drama, but I didn't know the drama would be about things like Easter presents. It's literally so awkward. Willie and Kate were apparently upset that we hadn't given them Easter presents. Easter presents? Was that a thing? Willie and I had never exchanged Easter presents. Pa always made a big deal of Easter, sure, but that was Pa. I love this part. Kate looked out to the garden, gripping the edges of the leather so tightly that her fingers were white, and she said she was owed an apology. Meg asked, for what? You hurt my feelings, Megan. When? Please tell me. I told you I couldn't remember something, and you said it was my hormones. What are you talking about? Kate mentioned a phone call in which they discussed the timing of wedding rehearsals. Meg said, oh yes, I remember. You couldn't remember something, and I said, it's not a big deal. It's baby brain because you just had a baby. It's hormones. Kate's eyes widened. Yes, you talked about my hormones. We're not close enough for you to talk about my hormones. <laughs> so posh. Meg's eyes got wide too. She looked genuinely confused. I'm sorry I talked about your hormones. That just, that's just how I talk with my girlfriends. Willie pointed to Meg. It's rude, Megan. And that's not what... <laughs> It's rude, Megan. It's not what's done here in Britain. Kindly take your finger out of my face. Was this really happening? Had it actually come to this? Shouting at each other about place cards and hormones? Bruh. <laughs> like my thing is like, I can't believe that these are the types of things you're arguing about or like the types of like problems you have. But like I said, like this is all from his point of view. So from the way that he presented everything, you know, the stuff with his family and the media, it all seemed very shitty. And like in regards to like how the way that him and Megan were treated. And then near the end of the book, we do get to like information about like him and Megan wanting to just get away. Harry decides to sue media outlets for everything that they've posted that's incorrect. And then like his family was just displeased with this. And then after their first baby was born, he started running the idea by his dad of the possibility of them living elsewhere so that they could have more privacy. Like they were talking about like, oh, you know, part of the year, maybe in Cape Town or something like that. Um, but then when he like talked to everybody about it, everybody got like all weird and cagey. So I do see where the frustration came from. Like it seems like from the way he told it, everyone didn't like how him and Meg were when they were around them. But then when they wanted to get distance from everybody, like nobody wanted them to do that either. So eventually the palace went through all of these options with them, ranging from like, you know, everything just stays the same um, to you're completely cut loose. Harry had wanted to do like somewhere in the middle of this, like be half in and half out, like show up for royal events um, while living far away and like keeping perks such as like security. And the palace is like, nah, the best option is just the cut loose option. No half steppers in their crew. I don't want no half steppers in my crew. So then this passage, I felt like kind of summed up the entirety of his feelings and 
the book. My emotions are complicated on this subject, naturally, but my bottom line position isn't. I'll forever support my queen, my commander in chief, my granny, even after she's gone. My problem has never been with the monarchy or the concept of monarchy. It's been with the press and the sick relationship that's evolved between it and the palace. I love my mother country and I love my family. I always will. I just wish at the second darkest moment of my life, they had both been there for me. And I believe they'll look back one day and wish they had too. So they were supposed to have a year transition period where um, they could basically, before they got completely cut loose, where they could kind of like find their own footing. But that didn't end up happening. Um, they found out that their security was being completely cut. And then so he went to try to find his own security and he was quoted that it was gonna be like $6 million a year. So, you know, Hence probably the reason for writing this book to help pay for that. And then in addition to that, he also found out that he was going to be completely cut off by his dad. And I actually found his explanation about like basically his panic about being cut off to be very interesting. Um, and I thought it actually made a lot of sense. Exactly then while we were revising our budget, word came down. Paul was cutting me off. I recognize the absurdity, a man in his mid thirties being financially cut off by his father, but Pa wasn't merely my father. He was my boss, my banker, my comptroller, keeper of the purse strings throughout my adult life. Cutting me off therefore meant firing me without redundancy pay and casting me into the void after a lifetime of service, more after a lifetime of rendering me otherwise unemployable. I felt fatted for the slaughter, suckle, suckled like a veal calf. I'd never asked to be financially dependent on Pa. I'd been forced into this surreal state, this unending Truman show in which I almost never carried money, never owned a car, never carried a house key, never once ordered anything online, never received a single box from Amazon, almost never traveled on the underground once I'd eaten on a theater trip, Sponge, the pa papers called me, but there's a big difference between being a sponge and being prohibited from learning independence. After decades of being rigorously and systematically infantilized, I was now abruptly abandoned and being mocked for being immature, for not standing on my own two feet. So that's the thing, like I found that section to be very interesting and I found it to be a very straightforward explanation for his life basically, you know, like never having the opportunity to experience things and grow up the way that like other people have. But my problem with it was that like, he didn't plant the seeds for that throughout the rest of the book. Like he never really talked about how, you know, he never carried a house key or he never control, he never like physically held on to his own money or how he didn't order things online. I wish that he would have planted seeds for that throughout the rest of the book so that you could have like understood him more, but, you know, obviously it didn't happen. So the book ended with the passing of Queen Elizabeth, and I actually did feel the raw emotion from Harry's point of view with that. And then I had wished that more of the book was written the way that those last handful of pages were written. Overall, I am just unsure what the point of this book was. Like the whole book was talking about how much he hates the media and how much of a burden they've been on his life. But then he wrote a book, which is guaranteed to garner even more media attention. Like I understand that you want your side of the story out there, but in all honesty, like how many people are even paying attention to the media and who even remembers all of those articles that were written about you from the 2000s or even articles that were written last year? I really do feel for Harry though. I mean, I just read 400 pages of him constantly trying to find his own way, find a way to stand out, but trying to find his own identity besides just being a spare. And I guess he kind of did in the end accomplish that by renouncing his position and going out on his own. But at the same time, that was the decision that the palace made for him. So like he didn't actually want to be out completely on his own. So I don't know if he even really found his own way. So personally, I didn't get much out of reading this book. I usually like reading memoirs to feel inspired by a person's life story. And this just didn't do it for me. But you know, obviously I hope that it all works out for Harry and hopefully he can find some happiness and some peace. So that is it for me today, guys. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you would like to subscribe to the channel, I would much appreciate it. The channel has been growing lately and I find that very exciting. So thank you if you are already a subscriber and we'll see you next time. Bye. Quicker out.
die. <laughs> oh my god, this is terrible.